Thank you very much, Dr. Kamrava, everyone at the center, and everyone at Georgetown University. It's really uh, great to be back here. And thanks to everyone here who came out to this event. I think it really is uh, a testament to Egypt's continued importance uh, for observers of the region and many of us who care about the outcome of those uprisings that began in late 2010 across the Middle East. And we know that, of course, whatever happens in Egypt uh, has a tremendous impact on the outcomes of movements across the entire region. We're already seeing the consequences of that uh, in places like Tunisia, Syria, and Palestine, and elsewhere, that clearly what's, what's taking place in Egypt currently is having uh, consequences there. I think it's probably fitting to begin by talking about the title of this talk, From Revolution to Coup. Uh, I find it quite interesting that in the week or so since this event has been announced, that virtually all the feedback that I've gotten has been about whether, th this question of whether the events of this last summer actually constitute a coup. Now putting aside the fact for the moment of whether the July 3rd military intervention led by General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and the subsequent unilateral imposition of this roadmap uh, and whether this actually fits the textbook definition of a coup, I, of course, believe that it does. Uh, what's perhaps more disappointing is that no one seemed to question the first half of the title, the revolutionary part, and whether the 25th January events of 2011 actually constitute a revolution. And one of the things that I suggest is that when the events that we've seen over the last few years will be one day written into history, that these events will not be recalled as a revolution. And this isn't only due to the fact that history is written by the victors, in this case, of course, the military, who's as counter-revolutionary as they come, but that even the losers, and in this case, the biggest losers, the Muslim Brotherhood, have no serious claims to the mantle of revolution. So what I hope to do in this talk is three things. First, I'd like to trace the trajectory of the Muslim Brotherhood during the last four decades of its history, highlighting what I think are some of the most important developments that give us a window into the organization's development up to the rise of the popular uprisings that took place in January of 2011 that ultimately led to Mubarak's removal from power. The second thing I'd like to do is then evaluate how that history shaped the decisions and performance over the course of Egypt's revolutionary moment, if you will, during the last three years in, in looking at the Muslim Brothers' performance over that time period. I think that by examining the history, it will actually give us a better sense of how to actually evaluate its performance during this period. And looking at these actions, these decisions, and their consequences as part of long-term processes that have been at work for a very long time. And finally, with the remaining time that I have, I'll conclude with something that I think all historians love to do, which is to talk about the future. What challenges did the Muslim Brotherhood face going forward in light of the current circumstances that we're seeing them facing in this event, this saga that's unfolding literally by the minute? What kinds of responses and reactions might we expect to see in the coming months and years? And after that, I very much look forward to all of your uh, questions and comments. In examining the Muslim Brotherhood's legacy, specifically as it relates to this current revolutionary moment, one of the first questions might be, well, why single out the last four decades in its history as I've done, especially when we consider that the Muslim Brotherhood has an 85-year legacy that goes all the way back to the foundation, of course, by its charismatic leader and founder, Hassan al-Banna, and that it's actually experienced very few or minor ideological or organizational shifts since that initial period. But one of the things that I've argued is that with the group's re-emergence in the 1970s, following the release of its remaining leadership from the prisons of Gamal Abdel Nasser, it, win it witnessed a rebirth that redefines this original Islamic mission or message of the Muslim Brotherhood in a very different and new context. So what do I mean by that? If we're looking at the early period of the Muslim Brotherhood, one of the things, of course, we're seeing is that the context very much matters. That you have a situation, at least in the 1930s, the interwar politics, the so-called liberal experiment that's taking place within the Egyptian society at that time, the colonial rule, the continuation of the British occupation, the, the, the supposedly corrupted monarchy that, of course, is becoming increasingly unpopular, 
a parliament, an elected parliament that's made up of the old landed elite, that all of that, of course, no longer exists in the period that we're now looking at. But also, if we go forward in time and look at specifically the authoritarianism of the Nasser era, with its experiments in revolutionary socialism and Arab nationalism, and of course the massive widespread repression of all independent social and political forces, that that too is also something that doesn't exist after the 1960s. And so it's really that period with the rise of Anwar Sadat to the presidency in 1970 that brings about the Muslim Brotherhood and reshapes it in the way that we know it today. Egypt, of course, during this period finds itself in a decidedly new era politically and socially. And though he was by no means a Democrat, Anwar Sadat did establish the semi-authoritarian political system, the liberalizing economic arrangements that would come to define Egyptian politics from the 70s through basically the end of the Mubarak period. This was a political system that shifted autocratic power away from the military and toward this new urban middle class. It witnessed the rise of an oligarch class that benefited from the economic liberalization measures. And it saw, of course, the rise of a new political base of regime beneficiaries that were eventually represented in the National Democratic Party and its patronage networks. So how did these broader political and socioeconomic developments affect the Muslim Brotherhood specifically? Well, during the course of its reconstitution, the organization's veteran leadership tapped into this emerging social group that was increasingly urbanized, middle class, professional, and to a certain extent, more religiously devout, due in large part to this disenchantment or disillusionment with the failures of the Nasser period and its failure to answer the problems that were facing Egyptians throughout the 1950s and 60s. Now the group's base at this point was made up of a combination of rural support, which it had historically enjoyed, the Muslim Brotherhood that is, but as well as a new urban middle class professional leadership, which we start to see emerging, especially out of the student movement of the 1970s that I cover, and then the professional syndicates and charitable organizations and institutions that take place beginning in the 1980s and beyond, what Kerry Wickham, for instance, has termed the lumpen intelligentsia. These are the leaders of the student movement and the people who, of course, were trained not necessarily in Islamic activism as, as a way of, of kind of uh, developing their professional uh, identities. Many of them, of course, come out of technical or scientific fields. They're physicians. Uh, they work in engineering or uh, in pharmacy. These are the kinds of degrees that they pursued. And what this means, of course, is that they then uh, have deferred the idea of Islamic activism to the previous generation of, of uh, leaders, of movement leaders, who have, of course, established what the Muslim Brotherhood ideology is. And so the changes that we, ex we see exhibited during the 1970s and beyond mean that there was little actual change in the ideology of the movement. And in, in fact, what we see more of is a streamlined approach to the Muslim Brotherhood message. We see a reconstitution of the dawah, the modes of delivery in the way that the Muslim Brotherhood is now beginning to appeal to uh, Egyptians during a time in which we're seeing more of a fragmented sense of Islamic identity. We see the rise of multiple movements beyond the Muslim Brotherhood, which of course historically had always experienced a monopoly on Islamic activism. And this is not only competition among Islamist groups, but even the state itself becomes an actor in this marketplace of Islamic ideologies as Anwar Sadat himself is beginning to try and characterize his rule as Islamically sanctioned. He, he calls himself, of course, the believer president. And so what this means over time is that the Muslim Brotherhood is slowly beginning to engage more directly with society and to a certain extent as well with the state. And so this, what this tells us, I think, at, at least insofar as how it relates for the organization's development up to the period of the 2011 protest is that it's increasingly trying to reach some level of accommodation with the state as opposed to being a revolutionary movement, which I argue it never actually exhibited. And so if we look across the breadth of history, or at least the Muslim Brotherhood's history, it's always been behind the revolutionary curve in Egypt. It's not a revolutionary movement, it's a reform movement. And this difference is critical to understanding how it actually behaved and performed during the last few years. And so if we look at just different supposedly revolutionary moments in Egypt's history, for instance, in the 1952 coup 
that brought Gamal Abdel Nasser and the Free Officers to power, the Muslim Brotherhood was the most reticent to actually support those movements. They were led at the time by Hassan al-Hudaybi, the general guide after Hassan al-Banna, who was perceived by Abdel Nasser to be a relic of the old regime, part of this old landed Egyptian elite, and of course, as a result, the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't actually wholeheartedly embrace the 1952 revolution, and we know, of course, of the fallout that occurs in 1954 and the widespread repression uh, that results afterwards. We see this also again in the 1970s and early 1980s when we find the rise of militant groups that were inspired by the writings of Sayyid Qutb, desiring to bring an Islamic revolution to Egypt, that the moderate mainstream of the Muslim Brotherhood, led by Omar al-Tirmisani, who then becomes the general guide after Hassan al-Hudaybi, that he actually condemns this militancy and this revolutionary <coughs> rhetoric of these movements, instead reaffirming gradual change and commitment to social change through a long-term process rather than through revolution. More recently, we see this, of course, through the leadership of Mahdi Akif and Muhammad Badia, the last two general guides of the Muslim Brotherhood, when they were considering the possibility of joining with a broader, rising, non-ideological social movement that emerges from within Egyptian civil society that's represented by groups like Kifaya or the April 6th movement. And of course, we see that the Muslim Brotherhood opts not to join with those movements and instead focuses on its narrow opposition to the regime, which focuses purely on these internal reforms to the system and respects the, the so-called red line of not opposing the hereditary plans in place for Gamal Mubarak to succeed his ever-aging father. But it's one of those interesting things when you listen to some of the Muslim Brotherhood leaders recently, and not many of them, of course, have had the luxury of being able to reflect on the last few years, but those who have, many of them, of course, being in exile, one of the common things you'll, you'll hear is that the Muslim Brotherhood was not revolutionary enough, that this was actually their fatal mistake during the last few years. Well, what do they mean by, by that, not revolutionary enough? Let's actually examine the legacy of the Muslim Brotherhood during the period of the January 25th uprising and beyond. Well, up to the point of, of, this, of these protests, the Muslim Brotherhood had slowly begun to try and, uh, and reach some kind of accommodation with the Mubarak regime. In 2005, there was a sort of unspoken agreement between the leadership of the Guidance Bureau, the central decision-making body within the Muslim Brotherhood, and Mubarak, in which they basically were allowed to, to contest for a very specific percentage of parliamentary seats in those elections, they end up winning an unprecedented number of seats, 88, which makes up 20% of the Egyptian parliament. This has never happened before in Egypt's history. And of course, the idea being that they're slowly being integrated as this kind of acceptable opposition, even while the political party, or even while the organization is effectively outlawed, the, the group, of course, has to run its candidates as independents. Their charitable institutions and other arms of social services that they offer are all capable of, of operating within this, this sort of semi-autocratic um, arrangement with the regime, which basically turns a blind eye to the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood. Many of them, even the candidates who ran for parliament, were able to actually put the Muslim Brotherhood logo on their campaign posters and materials without any real backlash coming from the regime. And so as it has all of these gains in mind, the idea of then joining with a popular protest in 2011, of course, means that the Muslim Brotherhood would be risking a lot of these uh, goals or a lot of these gains that it, that it had obtained. And so the initial decision by the Guidance Bureau, even at the expense of the support coming from the lower ranks, especially the youth movement within the Muslim Brotherhood that did take to Tahrir Square on January 25th, was that they shouldn't actually come out in support and that they took a very neutral position to not endorse the protest formally. And it was only three days later when the momentum was clearly uh, picking up that finally the leadership then reverses its decision and decides to flood Tahrir Square with its supporters, who of course played a very critical role in some of the biggest clashes between them and Mubarak's uh, security agents. But at the same time that they were doing this, the Muslim Brotherhood again took the strategy of trying to hedge its bets. They also had backroom dealings with the chief of intelligence of Hosni Mubarak and tried to find some kind of uh, accommodation in which they would actually then perhaps call off their role in the protests in exchange for some kind of uh, concessions coming from Mubarak that would have essentially allowed the regime to remain in place. And it was only the persistence of the protesters, again, many of whom were supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood, but decided to stay and support uh, and support the protest anyway that Hosni Mubarak is ultimately forced to step down 
on February 11th of 2011. And after, the, after this happens, of course, many people celebrate. They declare that this is the revolution that they've been hoping for and working for. But from that very first moment, there was still a decision to be made about what the course of this supposed revolution would take. And the Muslim Brotherhood, along with millions of other Egyptians, faced a very critical choice. Do they support a transition to a new government that was basically being put in place by the military, or do they demand true revolutionary change by opposing all attempts by the military to try to impose its roadmap for the ensuing transition. Once again, the Muslim Brotherhood chooses the path of least resistance, putting its full mobilizing capacity behind the March 2011 referendum, in which an overwhelming majority of Egyptians voted to endorse a roadmap that scheduled parliamentary and presidential elections ahead of the monumental task of rewriting the Constitution. What this implied was that the institutions of the state the most critical institutions, the bureaucracy, the judiciary, the police, the intelligence services, most major ministries would essentially continue to function with a business as usual attitude, with only cosmetic changes being made. They tore down robotics portraits from their walls, they got rid of some of the more outwardly corrupt officials as a token gesture to the revolutionaries, and they paid lip service to the demands of the revolutionaries, but there was little actually that was substantively done about the functioning of these institutions in the weeks and months after Mubarak's fall. In fact, in many instances, as we've seen, for instance, with the police and the military, they actually circle the wagons, they take measures to protect their vested interests, and they ensure that uh, if Egyptians are really demanding this change, that they're really going to test their will to enact actual revolutionary changes. And we see this in some of the initial tests that take place. The police, for instance, which essentially stops functioning, they abandon their posts, they make Egyptians make a very critical choice between their support for the revolution and their own personal security and safety. Another test comes from the judiciary, which makes a mockery of the attempts to prosecute Mubarak and his lieutenants. And an even more brazen ruling, the Mubarak era Supreme Judicial Court, which had overseen some of the most corrupt and fraudulent elections in, Egypt, in Egyptian history, had the audacity to disband the first freely elected parliament on a minor technicality but all the parties, including the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party, stayed silent and chose to abide by that ruling. And so in the course of playing this, this unfolding political game, the Muslim Brotherhood was counting on several things. First, as the leading opposition movement under Mubarak, they believed that they stood to to uh, gain the most by preserving at least some elements of the former regime's ruling arrangement. To, strap, to scrap that system entirely would have jeopardized all of the gains that they had made over the previous couple of decades, and enacting a true revolution would have meant that they, they would simply be put on par with every other social force and political uh, party that was being established that claimed to have this, this vision for the new Egypt, and of course this means that to certain extent that they had benefited, of course, from the previous arrangement and they hoped to try to preserve or safeguard at least some of those gains. Secondly, I think there's something to be said about the fact that they continue to be in awe of the power of the military rulers. And this is possibly a product of years of psychological subjugation at the hands of the military that goes all the way back to the Nasser era. But for whatever reason, the Muslim Brotherhood continuously took exceedingly cautious positions in dealing with the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. And even after the first civilian president was elected in Egyptian history, the Muslim Brotherhood continued to defer to the military on a number of critical issues. They guaranteed them immunity from prosecution for all of the abuses that they committed during the protests. They ensured that their economic interests, which some, some people have speculated could reach even up to 40% of the Egyptian economy, uh, being in the hands of the military, that they ensured that these economic interests would remain completely untouched. And they even enshrined a lack of transparency and accountability of the military to a civilian government in the constitution that was passed last December. And in so doing, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood was actually helping to create the climate in which a freely elected president could be overthrown by a defense minister and head of the military who was appointed by that elected president, and that there would be actually no outrage from any of the institutions of the state and very limited outrage from the general public. And so as it did under Mubarak, once again, the Muslim Brotherhood appears to have been hedging its bets. It tried to appease these military authorities 
avoiding all-out confrontation with the state, and focus on gradual reform to, state, to selected state institutions while avoiding many others like the intelligence, like the judiciary, and like, of course, the foreign policy establishment. They had no substantive way to address the oligarchical structures that had been in place uh, over a, a long period of time. They couldn't, of course, handle the, uh, the pressures, the economic pressures that, were, that the Egyptian people were being subjected to over the course of the Morsi presidency. Um, and of course, we see this even playing out in the uh, debacle that was the IMF loans in the attempt by, by Morsi to actually bring about uh, financial aid for uh, the Egyptian economy. And finally, I think one of the other uh, observations, at least insofar as the Muslim Brotherhood's assumptions are concerned, is that they counted on democratic legitimacy to trump the power of the so-called deep state. Now, I actually hesitate to use that term. I think it's been overused and misused. But for lack of kind of anything that really captures what we're trying to, to describe here, these, these deeply rooted institutions within various uh, corners of power within the Egyptian state that have been termed a deep state, that they believe that simply by winning elections that this somehow uh, provides you with the kind of democratic or, le or legitimate cover to be able to actually uh, outlast the maneuvers by some of these uh, state institutions. And I think it's very ironic that although in many circles there's been a deep and abiding distrust of Islamists as being forces hostile to democratic institutions, this is actually the one area in which we can say the Muslim Brotherhood has been the most consistent. They've won every election that they've contested from March 2011 all the way to December 2012 on at least five different occasions. Millions of Egyptians went to the polls and voted in favor of the group's candidates or its positions uh, on uh, a given referendum issue. Every single time, they prevailed. This seems to have established a belief, perhaps a false belief, within the minds of their leaders that although the organs of the state, which they have had no control or even attempt to control over all of these, uh, all of these different institutions, would somehow be able to roll back these victories over time. And so what we've seen, for instance, is that this, this psychological effect of democracy is somehow trumping the power of the deep state or the power of this, the, the former regime's uh, apparatus of power, uh, that there couldn't be any concrete measures taken to roll back these democratic gains, at least insofar as they were becoming institutionalized within this emerging, uh, this emerging state system that Egypt was, was trying to transition toward. And so what this means in practical terms is that although they understood the threat, they recognized that, yes, the judiciary could try, for instance, to dismiss the elected parliament, that they could dismiss candidates who were running for the presidency uh, or dismiss their nominations but on technical grounds, but they couldn't actually dismiss the idea, they couldn't roll back the idea that there should be a freely elected parliament or there should be a freely elected president that those systemic changes were somehow being completely deeply rooted. And I think they overestimated that that had actually taken place, especially given what we see now in terms of the way that uh, the, the current roadmap, the current transition is really only paying lip service to the idea that there will be elections. And if there are elections, hardly anyone actually believes that they'll be free and fair or open to all different parties, especially given what's happening to the party that won the most number of seats in the last election. And so while you could possibly sympathize with this logic that you really believe that democratic legitimacy has somehow trumped the, uh, the ability of the this, this state to actually be able to overcome, uh, that, that somehow Egypt had made it pa in a, in a point, past a point of no return, that this in fact clearly is not what had actually taken place. And of course, the Muslim Brotherhood through Morsi's presidency overplayed its hand. And of course, this, I think, extends even beyond the Muslim Brotherhood, that all of its revolutionary partners as well had failed to uproot those institutions of the past. And for all that we've heard about the so-called ikhwanization of the state, or the, the idea that the Muslim Brotherhood was then placing all of its key supporters and figures within these various sensitive positions in, in the state structures or the state bureaucracy, when the equinization took all of five minutes after the overthrow of Morsi, you wonder whether it was ever really something to begin with. Probably not. And so now I've tried to make the case that the Muslim Brotherhood hadn't really taken over the levers of power, 
And so I didn't actually deem it very necessary to talk about its performance from a policy standpoint. I think that's something we can certainly discuss further if you're interested in it. Uh, but suffice it to say that the portfolios in which they did try to exert some degree of control when they were in power, uh, the record was very mixed, and that's really putting it generously. I'd say a couple of points about that, though. First, I think this is really what you get when uh, a state that's been living under dictatorship for 60 years all of a sudden opens the way for political participation on the part of its citizens who have neither the vision nor the experience to be able to put forward. And of course here, uh, the second observation being that the Muslim Brotherhood somehow overestimated once again its ability to really put forward a comprehensive platform for governance that the ways in which, for instance, they manage their social, uh, social services institutions, their charities, their schools, their mosques, simply could not translate well to the institutions of the state. It was just not the, the same kind of transition that they perhaps had assumed or many other outside observers have thought that that somehow serves as qualifications. I mean, I know it's, it's a kind of interesting thing that we see um, uh, taking place you know, in, in political systems around the world in which someone could basically say they were a community organizer and that gives them the kind of credentials to become president. Well, that's the kind of platform that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was attempting to run on, at least insofar as, as they hoped uh, that their deep experience as being kind of this so-called state within a state would somehow translate well into um, the, uh, the levers of power once they were able to be elected into the parliament and then later into uh, the presidency. And of course, this, I think, was a highly presumptuous assumption and of course the failure to then build some kind of consensus with the other revolutionary factions, not to say that there wasn't a high degree of obstructionism, again, from many of those sectors. We could talk about individual figures and movements and how they also interacted to try and subvert the, the attempts by the Muslim brother to actually govern effectively. But in the end, I think it was, it's, it's clear to say that the, uh, the revolutionary moment was, was certainly lost, uh, at least insofar as the divisions that emerged within this revolutionary consensus that never really took hold. And then, of course, in the way that the institutions of the state really um, left their mark on, on the uh, Muslim Brotherhood as well as other organizations. So I'd like to conclude with just a few thoughts on where things are likely to be headed in the coming weeks and months. I imagine that many of us have been watching with consternation what appeared to have been a popular movement to challenge the Morsi presidency on June 30th and the protests that have manifested into something else entirely. A return to military rule, emergency laws, wide arrest powers for the police, mass killings that have been unprecedented in Egypt's modern history, the destruction of property, the shutting down of independent and opposition media, and an attempt to spread a culture of fear that we thought had been completely undone by the January 2011 uprising. The military appointed government of General Sisi has assumed a total war position against the Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters, but has also signaled that there will be no room for political dissent from any quarters from within Egyptian society in this new emerging arrangement. The organization is likely to be banned. Its leaders have already been imprisoned. Many of them are on the run or are in exile. Its institutions have been destroyed. Its assets have been seized. Its media has been shut down. And of course, thousands of its members have been arrested. And one of the things that we keep hearing about lately is that in spite of this impending repression and ban on the Muslim Brotherhood, the organization is bound to survive because it has always been banned and it's always survived. In fact, we've even heard some people who've said that it prefers to live in the shadows, that it prefers to actually flourish within this, this kind of underground scenario. But without questioning the survival instincts of the Muslim Brotherhood, I would urge caution on that for a couple of reasons. First, I think it's been made clear that this impending repression that we're seeing now is going to be unlike anything that we've seen before. First, the military believes that they have a popular mandate to destroy and suppress this Islamic impulse that exists within society as represented by the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's even employed, of course, the war on terror discourse that we've seen, the imagery of it, in order to try to pursue it and destroy it. This is likely to continue and actually would probably even be stepped up in coming months as this military and police violence will give way to legal and institutional attempts to repress the organization. And unlike in past eras where the authoritarian rulers couldn't afford to have an all out ban on the organization, they allowed it to continue, they turned a blind eye as we said before, they allowed it to, to kind of survive and thrive within certain corners that it had 
uh, or certain areas that it had basically carved out for itself. That, this, that the fear, of course, at the time was that if Mubarak or Sadat or anyone was really going to clamp down completely on the Muslim brother, that this would actually engender a wider revolt or a wider protest movement that it could perhaps even consolidate around a wider opposition. Well, the military regime that's in place now doesn't have that fear. They, they, they believe that this is really an attempt to try and crush the organization. Uh, but secondly, I would say, and perhaps more fundamentally, it's important to note that although the Muslim Brotherhood has a history of existing underground, safeguarding its organizational structure and hierarchy from the machinations of the state security apparatus, it's increasingly moved away from that over a process that goes back to the mid-1990s and was accelerated really in the last three years. The organization was becoming increasingly public. It was functioning in relative openness. For the first time in decades, observers, the general public, and perhaps more cru crucially, the institutions of the state were becoming increasingly aware of how the organization functions, its internal mechanisms its uh, formal and informal structures, the key players, the key internal divisions and, and um, factions that exist within the organization, uh, the modes of communication, the informal networks of mobilization that exist, the placement of its assets, the relationship between the central hierarchy and its various social services institutions. Even the names and profiles of thousands and thousands of its members were becoming exceedingly public and well known. This development makes it exceedingly difficult to assume that it can somehow outmaneuver the state, the repressive state apparatus, that is, in the coming months, and will therefore have to rely on the relative permanence of its message to really live on as opposed to its organizational structure. The popularity of this mission will live at the expense of the organization. And so I would argue, at least in, in kind of conclusion, that this could potentially result in some kind of positive externality in this could be the silver lining, perhaps, but that as an unintended consequence of the state's desire to destroy the Muslim Brotherhood will actually enable the development of alternative modes of organization and mobilization by the remnants of the Muslim Brotherhood with a particular emphasis on the youth generation, those, of course, who perhaps are able to evade this repression because they're very low-ranking members of the organization and, and don't have high leadership uh, positions. Many of them, of course, have also been traditionally very critical of the Muslim Brotherhood's leadership, who have desired for greater openness and, and greater interaction with uh, broader segments of Egyptian civil society. They've been the most ones that have been able to link up with some of the other revolutionary groups. And that perhaps this could lead to the development of something like a cosmopolitan Islamism, this term that I've sort of used to try to, to capture the idea that you can have a civic and Islamic identity in which you can use going forward at least, to frame the current conflict, not as one between embittered Islamists versus this, this emerging secular authoritarian state, but one of all Egyptians united to oppose the return of a brutal, exploitative, repressive regime and calling for the promise for this revolution to be uh, fulfilled. Thank you very much.